Bond wiped the sweat from his palms and worked the pistol slide, ejecting a bullet. With his knife, he pried out the lead slug and tossed it aside. He then pressed the cartridge filled with gunpowder into the wad of explosive which he molded to the door. He stepped back, aimed carefully at the tiny disc of his cartridge and squeezed off a round. The bullet hit the primer which set off the powder and in turn the plastic. With a huge flare, the explosion blew the lock to pieces. It also knocked Bond to the floor, amid a shower of wood splinters and smoke. For a few seconds he lay stunned, and he struggled to his feet and staggered to the door which was open though jammed. The gap was only about eight inches wide. He grabbed the knob and began to wrest the heavy, stubborn panel open. The government's case against me was building. Jones and Spagnoli were prepared for their testimony, which all matched up very neatly. Much too neatly for anyone who was really paying attention. As we stood outside the courtroom during recess, two Secret Service agents got off the elevator, escorting Richard Walters, the man who had shown up at my house asking for a gun with which he could Take care, Frank Jones. The agents Jordan and Sims could barely suppress their smirks. Walters, who used to say things like, I love you like a son, Abe, but who was there that day to help send me to prison, glanced fleetingly in my direction, but mostly kept his quivering gaze on the floor in front of him. Since the creation of modern intelligence agencies, there have been only seven of this special breed. Men who could by themselves carry out all four pestilential skills most prized in the unacknowledged black wars of our times. Gather intelligence carry out counterintelligence, implement the highest technological forms of warfare, kill, dispassionately, cleverly, cleanly, and without trace. The four phases of modern intelligence field operations. Seven. Four-phase men. Bond felt his breath failing in his lungs. Did he love this woman? Had he discovered too late? Stinging tears of frustration mingled with the sweat and blood on his face. He gave no thought to his approaching death, only to Scarlet in the gilded armchair in his Paris hotel room, her long legs demurely crossed and her empty hands folded in front of her breasts. Turning the last of his breath into a groan, Bond thrust himself upward with all his might in one final, dying effort. His hands went through packed sand and earth, then encountered air. He scrabbled frantically for a grip. Remember how long thou hast been putting off these things, and how often thou hast received an opportunity from the gods, and yet dost not use it. Thou must now at last perceive of what universe thou art a part, and of what administrator of the universe thy existence is in a flux, and that the limit of time is fixed for thee, which if thou dost not use for clearing away the clouds from thy mind, it will go, and thou wilt go, and it will never return. Bond wasn't very familiar with Kabuki. He did know that it was a traditional form of Japanese theater like No and Kyogen. It was noted for its stylized acting, gorgeous period costumes, beautiful scenery, and stories on an epic scale. He knew that the actors were all male, even the ones playing female roles, and that the famous ones were descendants of the original Kabuki acting families. Best not to bother any of them. He left the dressing room area and moved along the main corridor until he came to a stairwell. He took the steps two at a time to the second floor, where he saw Ichihara creeping along and looking for a place to hide. Their eyes met. The killer froze in shock, but after a second, he darted down the hall, which opened onto a metal fire escape. Bond dashed after him, kicking off the slippers as he went. Deep Voice Dynamo Vocal Solutions where bringing a voice to your vision is my statement of mission. If your project is in need of a vocal solution, book me today.